Musical linguistic objects. <laughs> Greetings from Cyberdelic Space. This is Lorenzo, and I'm your host here in the Psychedelic Salon. And even though it's now summertime, uh, at least here in the northern hemisphere of this beautiful little planet, there are a lot of uh, -of out-of-the-ordinary financial requirements brought about by vacations and other summer activities. And yet, uh, still some of our fellow saunders have nonetheless decided to share their bounty and uh, help us by uh, paying some of the expenses associated with these podcasts. And these wonderful people are Lawrence C., Joshua M., Nigel B., Nathan S., Jonathan R., Derek H., Walks Between Worlds, Nicholas K., and Guani, or is it Joni? Uh, Guani H.? I hope I pronounced that close to properly, but uh, if not, please forgive me, because uh, as you know, I'm the product of the American school system, which leaves much to be desired, especially uh, in the area of languages. And, uh, like me, I'm sure that uh, most of our fellow slaughters by now recognize the names of uh, several of these generous souls as uh, longtime supporters of the salon, and I thank them all from the bottom of my heart. As I mentioned before, I've started setting aside part of the donations that come into the salon each week for what I've come to think of as my last hurrah, which will be the 2012 Burning Man Festival. I'm not going this year, but I'll make it in 2012. And along with Bruce Damer and a group of uh, very creative and energetic younger people from the Pacific Northwest, we're uh, planning a theme camp for that event that is not only going to have some great parties at night, but will also feature a renewal of the Palenque Norte Plyologues during several afternoons. As I've learned the hard way, it's never too early to start planning your trip to Burning Man, and uh, so I hope that you'll give some serious thought to attending in 2012 yourself, and uh, if so, that you'll drop by for an afternoon chat. And I wouldn't even be able to dream about that if it wasn't for the great support from our fellow saloners. So thank you once again. Thank you all for being a part of this little experiment in a distributed online community. And unless I'm mistaken, uh, some members of our salon community are wondering if I'm ever going to get around to introducing today's talk, which uh, (laughs) is actually uh, one that I've been meaning to play for quite some time now. In fact, I can uh, still remember being there when Matt Palomary recorded this talk. And uh, hey, thank you, Mateo. I appreciate it. And I remember thinking at the time how valuable this information is and that it should be uh, reaching a much wider audience than the hundred or so people that were in the room at the Palenque and Theobotany Conference of 2001, where it was given. As you already know, uh, today we're going to hear from one of our most important women elders. And by elder, I don't mean someone who is old, because I'm a good bit older than today's guest speaker, who is uh, Kathleen, or Cat, Cat Harrison. And I think it was at the 1999 Ayahuasca Conference in San Francisco where I first heard Kat speak and uh, was completely mesmerized by her quiet wisdom. But it wasn't until January of 2001 at the Palenque Conference that I got to experience her as a person and not just as a featured speaker. You see, the way the Palenque Conferences were organized, everyone, uh, speakers and attendees, all ate our meals together and we all had our rooms in little cabins that were kind of scattered throughout a small jungle setting with a little stream running through it. And at night we'd usually sit on our porches uh, telling stories and passing the pipe around. And one balmy night, as a few of us were sitting on a porch near the little stream, What I remember was a wonderful gossamer vision of a beautiful lady floating into view and asking if she could join us. It was Kat, and while she demurred when we offered a toke from our pipe, she in no way made us feel like we were misbehaving children, even though her motherly influence could clearly be felt. I think about that night quite often these days because on the little altar that I've set up next to my desk, is a polished and lacquered slice of an ayahuasca vine that I bought from her that week. And on it is a little pipe that was made for me out of uh, clay from the little stream that flowed in front of our cabin that year. So every once in a while I like to pick them up and hold them just so as to bring back the vibe from those magical nights in Palenque. Well, so much for reminiscences. 
Instead, why don't I just play one of the talks that Cat gave back then? And again, I should let you know that at about the 44-minute mark, there's a short gap in the recording where Matt had to turn the cassette tape over. And during that short time, we missed a sentence or two, I guess, but isn't it nice that now we can record directly in digital and not be limited to tape length for recording time? You see, the world is getting better, you know, and in more ways than just improved tech. But anyhow, let's journey back in time to a lovely January morning in 2001 on a hilltop near the Mayan ruins at Palenque, Mexico, and hear a few of Cat Harrison's thoughts about the importance of ritual. So the talk I gave last night with my slides is material I'm really familiar with presenting and familiar with from my experience. And the slides, as I, as I mentioned, act as my guide for the uh, related ideas that come up from those images. Um, the talk I want to um, broach today is, a, for me, a novel... Uh, condensation of a lot of different observations and experiences that um, I think hopefully will be of interest to you Um, and to me to put them together this way uh, I find that after talks that I give on various topics and uh, not all that uh, people ask me a lot of questions about technique and form and uh, method not exactly like doses like so many questions have been here naturally but um, but more the uh, what the panel will be about later this morning too it's set and setting and um, and the formalities that create the, the ambiance that we have these experiences within and I've answered so many questions like that after talks that I decided to, to try to pull them together into a talk about um, form and ritual in regard to psychoactive plants, medicine, experiences. Um, uh, you know, I do have, I mean, I guess each of us has our, our vernacular that we are comfortable with, and, um, and I'm part of a, an extended, ever-shifting community of uh, ceremonials, basically, I, I guess we would call ourselves in um, mostly women, but not entirely in the United States, and um, I'll talk something uh, somewhat about what uh, I have learned working with these people, but one of the, some of it is terminology, and I just, we refer to psychoactive drugs and plants and mushrooms as medicine, and that works for us because it comes in under the radar, first of all, you know, you can even talk about it on the telephone, Um, and uh, also because, you know, so much of the, of psychoactivity is about healing and balancing and uh, even the joyful and, and, and celebratory aspects of that too um, definitely that too so that's my terminology and there are other terms hard for me to see perhaps but you'll hear them in my language I hear them in your language and I think it's really interesting to look at how we talk about these things and the way we look at folk names of plants too you know and what do those folk names mean and and as I was saying last night how many plants um, honor Mary or honor a mother goddess in their folk name including marijuana as a matter of fact so let's see Uh, the title the formal title that I gave to Ken for this talk was weaving modern ritual from traditional roots, and um, and I wanted to uh, talk about that from several different kinds of roots, levels of roots, and um, and you know I'm going to meander. I mean I made one page of notes here, but I know I'm going to meander a lot. So I I hope I'm just sort of like thinking out loud. I hope that's okay. Um, the word ritual, which I now am very comfortable with using, still I know gives uh, some people, even the more open-minded people, you know, the creeps. Um, and certainly uh, others who are less open-minded, it reeks of something, you know, scary and musty and hidden. Uh, but actually, it's really interesting to look at any culture, including our own, meaning Anglo, American, European um, in terms of ritual, you know, we just all went through 
the coffee ritual down here. We have lots of rituals that have to do with what we put into our bodies and exactly how we like our rituals. And, uh, <laughs> and we're usually very fussy about that they have to be just right or else we are out of balance, right? And um, so uh, if you begin to see that the way we form our behavior, the choices that we make in daily life and, in, uh, and on those holy days, whatever uh, religion or sacred tradition or nature worship or whatever it is we come from um, or, or, or wend our way into, that there are rituals small and large. There is form, intricate and loose, but it is still form that holds our behavior and that is actually modeling our belief systems, our worldview, in the same way that I was talking about with the Mazatex last night. And if an anthropologist was studying us, they could read a lot about what we believe and how we stratify the cosmos in our experience by the way that we ritualize. I recently um, got a letter from a, a very sophisticated, worldly Mexican friend, woman, artist, and she just made some allusion to how when she was in, she went back to visit her village and she met this, this uh, American man there and he was videotaping because that's what foreigners do. It's just, we, you know, drink coffee and videotape. It's just like our character. And I just thought, oh, you know, just that little like, twist in perspective. So the role of ritual, the role of, of uh, conscious, intentional behavior that is described by uh, culture or subcultural um, Kind of rules of behavior and with reflected meaning is, is just sort of a way of describing ritual generally and, and um, we draw these uh, we draw these forms out of a number of traditions I think when we go into thinking about how to do psychoactive medicines it's very valuable to look deeply, to look seriously at the traditions that have attended these, these medicines through time. Now I'm also going to include or in to somewhat, some degree address uh, those that are not traditional plants that are contemporary chemical derivatives or, or discoveries. And I, and I think that a lot of these um, guidelines can apply to those as well. But we do have a lot of information about how many of the plant and mushroom um, allies have been used over time. And so knowing about that and incorporating that into our own behavior, not necessarily mimicking it, but incorporating it, and so we're kind of uh, drawing inspiration from what we know of as this, you know, this field, you know, the idea of the morphogenetic field that, that uh, Sheldrake proposed of uh, repeated behavior in the same mode over a long time generates a kind of a, an etheric possibility uh, of it recurring and being potentized kind of, you know, by its ongoing uh, indefinite uh, repetition, ramifications of, of it and um, like, a, like a pebble in water and the ripples going out and they just keep going out and then if you come to those if you recognize a, a historic stream of ritual and you tap it a little bit even or acknowledge it then you gain the, the power of that cultural habit or multicultural habit and it comes into the ceremony that you're doing um, ceremony can be you by yourself sitting in a meadow having an experience. It can also be um, you in your alone in your uh, hideaway with all your accoutrements, and, and I'll talk a bit about that. Or it can be complex and, and multi-person, you know, but, um, but I think looking back into who has done these and how with what belief systems is really valuable to at least have in your pocket as you go, as you go through this. There are many universals about ritual, about sacred form, that uh, we can see in cultures around the world, whether we think of them as psychedelic cultures or not. And they have uh, a lot to do with, well, sacred time working. There is this concept um, of 
time that is different than the, the normal daily life that we wake up to and work in and raise our children in. And it, it's this time that we go into uh, in order to talk to the gods, in order to receive messages from the earth, in order to heal, in order to conceive, give birth, die, uh, be married, uh, recognize uh, transitional stages like, like initiation rites, you know. Uh, all of these kinds of times, and you know, this is very basic anthropological recognition uh, of these of these categories of social behavior. But um, that this, there's generally speaking, this idea that this is sacred time. Cere- I I go for ceremony happening, psychedelic ceremony happening within sacred time, and so uh, you know, I've learned a lot also from uh, the pagan tradition, which is blooming again in the United States and Europe. And that's really, I think, the people of European ancestry looking for our indigenous roots and our traditional uh, magical behavior. What works? What works to make us not feel like we are simply material beings in a mechanistic world, um, you know, thinking that maybe we're crazy because nobody else thinks like us, sort of. What works to actually make it be... um, feel like we're in that exalted state which can be achieved you know uh, without uh, without uh, psychedelics as well but when you put them together is truly remarkable um, I have found over the years that I have some sort of um, guidelines that I follow for achieving that kind of state and one is that I look to my own cultural genetic roots. I look to my own, the history in my blood of what my people, and probably like most of you, I'm a mix of different European, uh, you know, some of us have a touch of Native American way back there, but uh, mostly European um, cultures, for me, mostly Celtic. And so I educated myself many years ago now as to Celtic traditions, some beliefs about the hierarchy of deities, about distant time and present time, concepts of, of uh, that could be brought into my dream world, that could be brought into my ritual, um, ritual life. And I think that looking back into your own genetic history is, is one component. And then I feel that it's really valuable to look into the ritual history of the place where you live or the place where you're working, because that's in the earth, you know, it's coming up through that place, it's accessible. You can miss it, but you can also find it. And, you know, I've lived in Northern California now for um, 25 years or so, and the Northern California um, Indians have, they're still alive, they're still there, they're still doing healing rituals and ceremony and song and um, making beautiful things. And so I... um, educated myself and I met a few of them and I've asked them what they do you know what is their relationship to tobacco and ceremony since I know tobacco is the is the ceremonial boundary marker and um, and other plants what do they use for protection you know and then I learn the native plants and go find that one and keep a bit of it in my pocket pay homage to the history of ritual that is coming through the place and then if you're adding a psychoactive plant to your ceremonial moment, then again, the history of that plant and how it has worked. So you've got three components there. You've got your own blood history, you've got your place history, and you've got the, the substance history. And all of them have uh, uh, kind of magical structures within them, and they're pretty universal. I mean, you know, it's so great to look at anthropology because every place, every culture is fascinatingly unique, but there are these <coughs> universal um, behaviors and methods of categorization that just that do come through over and over, especially in nature-based culture, before they become so uh, much about the big, uh, more hierarchical civilizations. And, um, and so, you know, you might not be, as a scholar, correct to generalize, but as a, as a ceremonialist, you might be quite uh, it's it's all right to do that because you're just drawing from sort of the the whole palette um, and and what humans you know are so remarkable at is taking information and adapting it changing changing information changing behavior.
drawing from one thing to another. We are, we have incredible memories. We have creativity and, and opposable thumbs and hands to make things with. And, um, and we have this hunger for inspiration and the beyond. And all of these things come together in, in these ceremonies. I like to think of the form that I create as, um, as a vessel. So that then it, ha it is a container. And that means I take the elements that I want to assist me or that I think I just might need or um, that, I, that are mysterious to me but I would like to know more about. And I put them in the vessel of the, the time that is set aside to do this medicine. And it's a way of thinking, again, that, that uh, just delineates the form. And, I'm, and I, I know I said last night, and I want to reiterate this idea of protection, of creating a safe place. Protection, like the word ritual, can ring some bells because sometimes people think it means you, know, you only need protection when you're under attack. Well, not necessarily. Um, it doesn't... A lot of, of uh, indigenous shamans do get into a um, kind of a offense-defense way of thinking. And in fact, I, you know, there are healers, really fine native healers, who have put so much of their energy toward defense to do the work they do that they really can't do the work anymore. Um, sometimes they become so good, and, and in these the economies of incredible scarcity as exist in the Americas, um, uh, especially in native communities, uh, there is so much envy. I, I, every native person I've spoken to in the Americas can acknowledge that, that envy of someone else's good fortune, of the neighbor who has one thing they don't have, of whatever, is really a, a shadow that they live with, you know, and, they, and a lot of their energy goes toward resentment because there's just too little of everything to spread around and because they're so good at working in the magical realms. So those concepts that you've probably heard from the ayahuasca world, for instance, of darts, of, uh, of virotes, these magical disease darts that go shooting out from the, the perpetrating shaman to the, to the uh, so, you know, so-called white shaman or to the hapless non-shaman who then is, becomes ill because they're carrying this bad energy. There's lots and lots about that, and it's, it's very good to know about it, I think, but... Um, it's not the only reason for protection. You know, when we, we, the problem for us, as was exhibited slightly yesterday, in our culture is um, there are several <coughs> dangers, but one of them is the law and its visibility and its blowing it in public, you know, or being apprehended in some way. And so we need protection from that. We need to be cool. But we also need to feel safe within these ceremonies so that you're not spending your time in the state you know, working on that all the time. You need to be, to have the feeling that you are um, surrounded and you can do work, which I think of really as, as vertical. There's, um, you know, again, from the, from the pagan tradition, this idea of raising above you, individual or group, as you work, a cone of light. This idea that a, that a circle raises a, a cone of energy, of light, and that in the beginning of the sacred time that you go into, the delineated beginning of any one of these journeys, that you consciously draw this line of protection and you consciously generate light around you. So, so, um, you're, uh, so you're able to access messages, uh, visions, energy from all directions. Um, and and then to generate light out into the world. Um, I feel like, I mean, I take, I think it was Anne who talked about uh, people taking psychedelics for fun and entertainment and taking them for spiritual work. And I do tend toward the spiritual work. I mean, I call this life the work, you know, what is the work? And, and, and yet the work has a lot of joy in it too. And so I'm, you know, I'm not like, dower uh, <laughs> and, um, and and in fact I'm an old deadhead and I you know learned a lot of what I know by going to Grateful Dead concerts those are the biggest prayer ceremonies I've ever been in <laughs> I, I really learned a lot and I totally honor that tradition I want to talk in fact I'm really jumping around is this okay yeah <laughs> 
uh, a bit about how when we came into psychedelics in the 60s, uh, most of us in the 60s, maybe a few of you were in the 50s, I don't know, that, you know, it, it broke everything open. It broke the windows out and we got to see what we hadn't seen before, but what we experienced was um, a kind of beautiful chaos. And the chaos in itself was so, such a relief, was so exciting, so um, in creative, in incipient creati creativity, just, you know, an ocean of it, that it was absolutely thrilling, and that's why many of us believed for a while, we can change the world, this is our chance, you know, we're changing the world now. Well, I think we have changed the world, but we haven't changed it as dramatically as we as thought at the time maybe we could. Maybe we have, it just... We're not so patient. But, um, but that chaos was wonderful to be in. I'm so glad that I was, you know, a hippie with LSD in my pocket in 1966 and 67. And I mean, that was a really, really special time. And I had my sense of self-preservation, which not everybody did. So within a, two or three years, we began to see the casualty factor. You know, and, and that was very serious, and it became seedier, and then the other not-so-clear uh, substances started to come into it, and then we began to see other, we saw addiction, and we saw, and, you know, and then the, the Vietnam War sort of rose up, and we went into, you know, we went from, like, the celebration of consciousness into a kind of combat, and, uh, but with that consciousness, and, you know, much history that is so interesting to talk about has, has come down affected by that. But what I saw was that people kind of retreated. I mean, the Grateful Dead shows kept going on, and um, and there was great shamanism happening there. And if you never did experience that, don't doubt it. It, it really was, uh, was a remarkable phenomenon. But, um, and there was like a second wave of the, the freaks, you know, hippie travelers, that kind of thing. But it seems to me that people kind of went more into their private lives with their medicine then. Some people left them behind altogether. People kind of just clustered in their homes with it, went on their, their own private experiences. And then in the, uh, in the 80s, the concept of mixing serious form with medicine began to arise. And I really started to see it become very strong in the late 80s. And then I began to regular, regularly participate in uh, medicine groups, circles in the early 90s. And so in this last decade, um, I've seen, <clears throat> and I've seen that spread out and touch other people, I've seen form be taken much more seriously. And that something different happens. It's not a better or worse equation. It's that something different happens. And so uh, putting these creative, chaotic, matrices like a psychedelic into um, a conscious form and gen getting other people into this form together having it I shouldn't say getting people because it sounds like somebody's <coughs> generating it but I think it's welled up in groups of people and so groups together making this happen that are egalitarian you know I, I these are not uh, like I, I think that that a lot of psychedelic work can be divided into one model or the other, the, the therapeutic model, where you are generally led through by someone or guided or sat with while you're doing this work, and the shamanic model, which, although they're not absolutely um, separate, because certainly shamanism comes into the therapeutic model too, but where um, more on, based on the idea of the... Uh, ayahuasca circle or the peyote circle. Have any of you ever experienced the Native American church, for instance, ceremony? Well, it's a, it's a, you know, the only legal psychedelic um, practice in the United States, and it's a recognized religion, and um, the N Native Americans have been doing it. They had to accept a certain level of Christianity on it in the 30s when it was uh, made legitimate in order to maintain a religion in which peyote was the sacrament and not all of them still do that some still have a pretty strong christian overlay but some um some don't and have just returned to this very intense form and they had this idea circling back to sacred time they have this very clear notion that when you gather it takes a long time like a couple of months it can take to get together all the elements for a ceremony and the proper 
teepee or dwelling for it and the, the proper kinds of wood for the fire and the proper foods for ritual moments uh, during and after um, the ceremony, designated people with designated roles, men and women, and the medicine, of course. And, um, and then they have this notion that they go into sacred time when they call the circle. And they stay in that throughout. And then this is, this is traditional in all these practices too, pagans, lots of people. And, and it's only over when you actually allowed consciously break that sacred time. And you say, now I am outside of it. So during that time, one of their uh, signifiers of how that is in fact a whole different kind of reality that you're in is that they build a drum in that time. They build a water drum. They, don't, they bring the elements of the drum, the vessel, the skin, the lacings, the water, um, but they don't, it never exists outside of sacred time. After the circle has been called, after this miraculous fire that they, built in, that they build and maintain in perfect shape of a crescent moon all through the night, after everyone has, um, has begun the ceremony, the drum maker makes the drum in front of everyone, fills it with water before sealing the top plays the drum all night long and then before sacred time is broken it is opened and the water is poured out and the drum is undone again. And so that way of marking um, that certain things can only exist in, in this other kind of time is symbolic. There are things that we can do in our own ceremonies the same way. Tobacco pipes among some people only come together in already delineated sacred time. The stem to the bowl, they never meet other than during that time and they're taken apart uh, before it's finished. And that's part of this of the special pipes that are just for praying in high ceremony. That's among the Northern Plains Indians. I'm going to talk about some of the basics of doing ceremony that can be um, applied to either solo or group um, psychoactive ceremony. But, um, you know, I think that the... Uh, the main tenets that I should point out are um, in, let's see now, I'm going to try to stick mostly to neo-traditional, meaning, um, you know, what I'm experiencing among people like us, because there's so much that can be said about traditional cultures and I and maybe can illustrate with that, but, but I just think it's so interesting what we're forming right now. 10 years, 20 years from now, if we're all still on this troubled planet, um, somebody could look back and see what's happening in our cultural uh, level in terms of uh, evolving forms of, of spiritual tradition. They're always evolving in every culture, but they're definitely in a richly evolving mode right now among people like us. And, um, and one of the, uh, the basic uh, beginnings is, it's part of the invocation, and, and this is true, I think, when you're just alone in your bedroom or anywhere, is to ask, what, what we say is, we ask the spirit of the medicine to be with us. We, I ask the spirit of the medicine to be with me. It could be 2CB, it could be LSD, it could be peyote, it could be mushrooms. Um, it could be cannabis if you have some work to do and that's one of your allies. And of course allies is a, is a concept that is primary and one of those words in this, in this cognitive vernacular that I was referring to, but the idea that um, these are all, the, speaking for the plants, that these are species which are here as potential allies for us. Allies, friends, assistants, confidants, uh, and there are those of us who feel that, that there are chemical allies for us too. So it's not um, you know, um, an absolute nature-human um, boundary there. And, <clears throat> and there are others that are not allies for you. They may be, generally speaking, in the, in the category of human allies, but they're not your allies. And a really important job for every individual is to figure out which ones are and which are not. Why one may be your best friend's ally and not your ally is a mystery. And maybe you can solve that mystery or maybe not, but you should honor the fact that, um, that some things work for you and uh, some things are not your medicine, even though everyone around you appears to be having a good time. 
don't think you have to stretch to it, don't think you have to feel inadequate. Um, there, it's kind of like people, you know, we meet people that we really spark with and that we feel like we've known a long time or that we know we could, you know, do some great piece of work with or whatever. We meet, we meet others and if we're respectful, we know, okay, she's just not my type or, you know, I don't get him, but that's okay, seems to work in the group. And so, you, you know, we protect ourselves and we ally in that way. So ally with the, with the psychedelics in the same way and uh, peer pressure is still a very powerful thing no matter how old you are. It's not just a juvenile uh, problem. Um, so we ask the spirit of the medicine, and I think it's okay to talk about that. I mean, I know some people get itchy at the word spirit too, but um, uh, it just means, spirit means breath. That's where the word comes from. And inspiration, spirit, all of these come out of the word for just breath. And since breath is the primary shamanic technique, the primary technique of the living organism, um, and the primary grounding technique in these, in these sessions, you know, if you don't do anything else, if you just remember to breathe and you think about your breath, the old meditation technique, you will have the first tool of, of, uh, of wise survival of troubled waters, you know. So, um, so asking the spirit of the medicine, no matter what kind of medicine it is, I think is a way of, of, of focusing. You're not just saying, I'm here and I want something amazing to happen to me or I want to have a good time. You're saying, who are you, medicine? This is me. Will you come in and be with me to help me see what I haven't seen yet, you know? To help me do the thing that I'm trying to do. So it's a, there's so much respect that is required in dealing with these incredibly powerful medicines. And I have learned from Native people to voice that respect, to honor um, each other, to honor the medicine. That means, for me, I bring offerings. I create a space, even if I'm off in nature somewhere, you know, what sort of, it's what I, it's a category I, I call windfall. You know, windfall is what the wind comes along and knocks from the trees to the ground. Windfall is something lucky that falls in your path. Um, we use it that way in, in common language. And so the, the things that just appear before your eyes, that when you're paying attention, um, many of them have a kind of, they seem to have a heightened meaning or, a, or an enhanced beauty, even before you've taken the medicine, certainly afterwards, you know. Um, <laughs> and you can bring some of those together wherever you are. What bloomed in the garden that day, put it on the altar, make an altar, however simple it is, you know, just a, a rock on the ground with a leaf, with a, a blossom and an acorn on top of it. The intention, the aesthetic, these things go together to make the space become a different kind of space and the time a different kind of time. And that's what we're asking for, I think. Um, some of my friends uh, who and I who are used to doing medicine circles um, do what we also call medicine walks. And it's just, I mean, you've probably done this, but um, maybe formally, maybe casually, but it's... Um, it's a whole different thing than the uh, than the you know all night focused ceremony which I'm getting to which is which is very intense. It's just agreeing to go. Usually taking one medicine that so we're on the same state of mind, but not necessarily. Um, but going to the beginning of a really good hike somewhere where we're not going to encounter many people in the path as well marked and uh, meeting it you know, nine in the morning, bringing our medicine, maybe bringing some, some sage for smudge, sitting in a circle for 15 minutes, um, saying, asking for the spirit of the medicine to, to be with us, saying our intention, one sentence, just little, you know, it's light, taking the medicine, and then walking for six hours together, you know, in a psychedelic state, slowly, some of us down on our knees, ooing and awing over things, some of them spouting philosophy and walking on ahead, you know, we have the, we found that the verbal people are in front and the, and the perceptual people are in the back, you know, the slow end. And, um, and until, and we've timed it so that there's, you know, a designated driver or two who knows that by 5 p.m. they're going to be able to drive us to a really fine restaurant and then we're going to finish it up and we close that circle before we get in the car, you know. But it's a wonderful way to be together in a kind of, when people walk together, they shift position all the time and the unexpected keeps bubbling up all the way along, but you're also 
in a form that you have created. And so just that addition of formality to it is a really, um, it's just a wondrous thing. The elements that I wanted to cite are invocation, as I've mentioned, invoking the name of the medicine, the name of the plant, and the asking it to, to um, join you in your work, giving it offerings, giving the place, acknowledging the place that you're in, acknowledging the directions I find is a very good idea because, you know, these things are very disorienting. So everything you can do to place yourself in time and space is clarifying, empowering. So knowing where is north, south, east, and west, if you know anything about the qualities of those directions which we learn from native people if we don't know them from our own experience and intuition just even what you know about the light from each of those directions the season then acknowledge it turn to each direction and just say you know thank you to the east for bringing the dawn please you know watch over us in the passage of this experience thank you to the south for the fire and the warmth and the passion that kind of thing you know and you can get much more elaborate than that and, and with ceremony, elaboration is definitely something that happens. And so, you know, what we have to be aware of is how much of that elaboration do you want and how much sort of uh, flowing in the state of mind do you want. But um, I really encourage you to use some of these techniques and see what happens. Um, acknowledging the spirits of the place uh, that are actually living in the earth there, asking to be not only the four directions, but the directions above and below. I like to think of myself as rooted, my feet rooted, so that I can return to that when I'm um, wobbly. When you begin to really shake or some thought complex has come in that's like one of the real big hard ones, you know, or stuff gets chaotic and shadowy, then if you remember your feet are in the ground, you can root right down into this big earth that's holding us. You breathe the air in and out, and your head is in the trees. Your head is the crown of light and the spirit, and you, you can feel a hundred feet tall then, and, and you, you come back to yourself, and you come back to the um, beauty of the moment, the strength of it, the vulnerability is okay. Your vulnerability is okay if you're grounded. It's when, I find, when you lose that, that you start to scramble, you know. Um, breath, as I said, is the, um, I'm kind of going back and forth between elements of form and technique here. Breath is the, the thing to remember always, and the, the flowering of breath is song. And this is in all of these traditions too, you know, but um, if you, even if you think you're not a singer, or even if you only know the lullabies that someone sang to you when you were a little child, and you, you know, don't think of yourself as a shamanic chanter or something, um, sing those songs. That, a, a childhood lullaby is the, that you sing to yourself, even, is the most comforting, rich, memory-laden, you know, piece of, of uh, kind of, almost tangible information that you can use in a state like that. You can certainly do that for other people too. So, um, and then just generating, I mean the tradition, the shamanic tradition is to allow songs to come through you, to be sung, as they say. I, I seek to be sung, and the song sings itself through you. And this is what you see in these, in these um, shamanic traditions where people are really uh, comfortable for, with, with this concept, what they're looking for are the songs that will be given to them as gifts. In the ayahuasca tradition, if, uh, if a song comes to you that has not been sung before, that you've not heard before, and it's coming through your relationship with a particular plant or a place or a, or a, or a spirit animal that has, that has come into you, then you regard that as one of the precious gifts in your life, that song, and you do all you can to let it be sung and remember it, which is really hard, um, and remember it so you can sing it again. And in the, that tradition, if you know the song of a plant really well, you can do medicine with that song. You don't have to have the plant, you don't have to take the plant. You, that song is now the signature of the medicine, and the song will work as well as the medicine. So it's a way of thinking about those songs that come to you in whatever state and, and 
sometimes even taking an old song that you know, an old standard of some sort where the melody works for you or the quality of the meaning, and you give it your own words. That can be one of your ally songs. And so you have like, you know, um, the, the northern Native American tradition is to, to always have your, your medicine bag that has your power objects in it, your, your pipe, your roots that are protective, your um, feathers for cleansing, your, you know, the different kinds of objects that are used in, in different tribes and, and traditions. And, um, and then to have these intangibles also in your medicine bag. So just think, you have an invisible medicine bag. It has invisible tools in it. It has invisible objects of beauty in it, which you can take out and array around you. And these songs are one category of that. These are shamanic tools that we all have the capacity to, uh, to generate or to allow to be generated in us and then to use in our work. You draw a circle, as I was saying, around you. Maybe a circle drawn in the dirt around three of you that are out in the world going to have a nature experience together. Maybe um, the form of the teepee. Maybe um, I, I often use tobacco and um, go out with a pipe of tobacco to the... Uh, I mean, I don't often use tobacco in my daily life, but I do in these situations, and go out and uh, blow tobacco in to the edges of where I want this work to be safe, to create this um, tent, this tent of uh, possibility, safe um, possibility, rich for our, um, for our intentions. And uh, sometimes, and just in terms of thinking about protection, sometimes during a ceremony, something from the outside or something inside will come up, like, um, you know, the, the flying, the bats that come at you, the equivalent of bats that can come at you in the state, you know, out of your memory, out of, who knows, out of all sorts of places. And, um, or sounds from a distance or a feeling, you know, like, um, it's a wonderful phrase in Star Wars, a tremor in the field. Is that, is that what it was? Tremor, a tremor in the force, yes. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi, a tremor, feel a tremor in the force. Yes, you feel that, you know. And so um, that's a time to use tobacco or smudge um, of some sort that, uh, uh, or even just motions, if you have nothing else, motions with your hands, just whisking and cleaning and getting stuff away, you know, of a person who's like overcome by fear from that, of a space where you feel it encroaching and you want to, just shoo, you know, shoo. We don't need you here. We're doing something else now. And I've seen this done in a fierce uh, manner in, um, in South America where something really strange and spooky can come along in the air. And, um, you know, there are many ways of defining that. But, but a, a shamanic person would jump to his feet and tremble and blow and, um, and shoo it off and so that we can then all return to the singing of, of uh, beautiful songs and uh, meditations on, on those kind of wonders. Um, so allow yourself to react in the moment. You know, I just think we undervalue intuition. And um, an old woman that I worked with in the Amazon, uh, not a not a curandera, just a woman who, you know, experienced an Indian woman who had experienced seventy some years of life in this world that is very much magical and uh, very many forces. Uh, interpenetrated, um, she said that uh, the most important information out there is the information you don't ask for. It's the unbidden information. Mm -hmm. So when you're walking along a trail in the forest, for instance, and you think you're looking for something. First of all, you're looking for snakes because you don't want to run into one. So we've mm -hmm. always got that up. But, you know, fear is a great teacher of perception. I mean, I, I, I really appreciate snakes for that. I notice a lot more things in a tropical forest because I know there are snakes there than I would if it were totally safe. It makes you pay attention. But that's a different, that's a different direction. And, um, but she's saying, you know, so that if something falls in your path suddenly or something crosses or something, you hear a sound that you've never heard before, you don't, you stop. You give it your full attention. And I think we're so, being more matter-oriented, we're so focused on our project 
that we often dismiss what we don't think is relevant to the moment we're living in. So we're not paying this kind of wide open attention to the unbidden information. And that's really what she taught me was the unbidden is is the most valuable. That's where we should stop. That's where they're speaking to us and we should stop and pit. Or, <laughs> you know, maybe I, you know, sometimes what you need to do is smoke another joint, but that's not <laughs> always the answer. <laughs> And, oh, that reminds me that uh, within allies, you know, I mean, I do feel like there are plants that are allies with other plants. And um, I, I, you know, am quite willing to admit that um, my oldest teacher, whom I very much respect, is LSD. And um, I, you know, got years of experience with that before I I really encountered anything else as powerful. And, um, you know, I kind of, I, I love, not only because of the history and, all of that, but I just love the clean, clear window of it. I, I'm really into all this animism, but once in a while it's just nice to look through a window, you know, and not exactly deal with a whole complicated being of another sort. And, uh, and I appreciate that about it, but there are, I don't see, personally, I don't see how a person can do LSD without cannabis. To me, they are wedded, you know, and um, so there's a way of setting up your... Um, your environment where you have you gather your allies you know and and I uh, do always make sure I have a full pipe of the very best cannabis I can find um, when I go into certain kinds of ceremony now that wouldn't be true with ayahuasca it probably would be true with mushrooms you know and but cannabis is my ally I'm not an abuser I'm a you know an aficionado and I have the good fortune to be that and I you know so um so recognizing allies and being prepared. I was a Girl Scout. Be prepared was our motto. <laughs> I have appreciated it all my life. You know, you knew just all the, you always had to have the jackknife in your backpack. You always had to have enough water. And, and, you know, I get teased still for telling people, do you have all your supplies? But there, yeah, it works. There, there are a couple of people in this audience who have thanked me very gratefully for teaching them how to go to huge psychedelic concerts how to be prepared, so, and how to set up your little station, and how to get through it without mishap, you know, because there's, there's a way to do these things. <laughs> the, the power objects in terms of talking about um, ceremony, and um, that besides, uh, that another thing for generating an altered state, you know, because a lot of this is about transgeneration as well, the medicine doesn't do it all, you guide the experience of the medicine with the things that you do. Um, and, you know, in the new, newer rave culture, I know seeking trance and seeking group mind um, is really, seems to be a, a major goal of those kinds of ceremonies, which they really are too, with the kind of music, the kind of drugs. I don't know, I just recently, a couple of weeks ago, learned the term, maybe you all know it, polydrug, the verb polydrugging, uh, taking many things at once, and uh, I... You know, I'm conservative. <laughs> I'm a traditionalist, <laughs> and um, I I don't want to uh, you know judge people, but I I do um, I do feel that there is a lot of danger there, and that I just love clarity, clarity of mind, and, and murkiness. I don't get it. You know, I don't get what's so appealing about that, and I and I think that when you start layering things on, all of these all of these you know physical sensations, the dancing, the strange thing, the con- lots of people, the, you know, exhaustion, and then multiple drugs, some uppers, some downers, some sideways, all that kind of stuff. I, I just encourage any of you who either do that or have children who do that, because really a lot of our young people do, um, to, to offer, to pass on guidance about uh, form and clarity and choice and not to go you know it's okay of course to go to these events but be careful of your body because the body is the limitation the liver is a limitation you know and I, that term polydrugging I just went oh no now it's it's really out there um, so back to doing this a rattle is a very very valuable thing to have with you a subtle rattle I would say uh, the sound subtle it's sort of uh, and and in the uh, South American ayahuasca tradition, I don't see rattles, but they use dried leaves, these uh, leaves that are bunched 
or Chakapa, it depends on where, where you are, which, which uh, word is used for them and which species, in fact, but generally it's a kind of palmetto species that the leaves dry and you put a number of branches of them together and when you shake them, they make that this slight rustling and it is so um, calming, integrating, and wonderful and they use it um, to raise and lower the visionary state as well. A person who is the, the, the ayahuasquero manipulating this, this uh, you know, trembling wand of dried leaves will uh, raise a state in a person who's too leaden uh, by coming up with the sound, brushing the energy up the spine, up toward the crown of the head. If somebody's like, whoa, I don't know what's happening to me, you know, usually an outsider, not usually an insider, but sometimes, um, they'll uh, bring it back down, bring the energy back down into the... Um, into the body and down, you know, following the uh, energy down to the base to root you again. And the sound itself is, uh, it's very, uh, I think it kind of makes, it weaves everything into a fabric. So you don't feel so much like you're a lost element in a wild, swirling tidal wave, which is what these things can feel like, you know. And the same with a very subtle rattle. If you've got your own rattle, if you're wobbly, or you are also, or if you're bored, if you're like seeking the vision, and sometimes these things are hard to get to, you know, and your mind is wandering off to, you know, your bank account, or you wish you had a good cup of coffee, or whatever it is, you know, can, they can happen. The seedy side of your mind when you're getting, you've gotten used to psychedelics, and you're not getting what you were hoping for. Um, <laughs> Pardon or paranoia, definitely, the fearful aspects, yes, then pick up your rattle. And like I say, subtle, small rattle, little sound. But just, the, you're shaking it. So you're empowered right there. You're making that sound. You're weaving the fabric. And you become embedded in the fabric. The other people do too. You can do it subtly. You can begin to sing with it. Often it can bring your voice. So these are just things to have with you. But to have the courage to use, and I think there's, something, it's kind of hard to, to describe, but there's something to um, talk about, which is our hesitancy and our embarrassment often to act like this, as though we're acting like Indians or something. We have this uh, attraction and, uh, and self-consciousness about um, imitation. So then remember, go back to, you know, they were using rattles 20,000 years ago in the caves of Europe and Asia. I mean, where the Neanderthals did ceremony. Did you know that? I mean, they were another species. They died out, you know, in the face of the Cro-Magnons coming up. They know that they were burying people with ritual, that they were putting um, herbs in their burial sites, that there were artifacts. If another species on this planet can develop ritual and the artifacts to go with it and... and uh, recognition of the power of certain plants and it's way deep in everybody and just just go back to it and don't worry don't judge yourself while you do these things the power of the action speaks for itself if you allow it to happen you don't lead with your head you just let your heart and your body tell you what to do in these moments then if you think it's time to get up and bolt out on the street you let your head come in and tell you no sit down you're not going anywhere i don't know how much of you how many of you do solo solo voyaging oh well a good sample great so I hope some of these things will be useful to you solo solo wise but um, so I want to uh, of course drumming is another has another aspect like like uh, rattling I just carry a very small rattle with me I carry smudge I haven't really talked about that that's you know a tradition that happens in many places too of dried plant material resin or leaves um, that you burn in order to, um, again, um, shape, cleanse the energy. There are certain herbal scents that, uh, that take away uh, baggage, darkness, um, fear, and there are others that invite <clears throat> peace, harmony, beauty. Um, there are ones that empty a space of anything else and leave it clean and clear to do something else in. So, you know, you learn to use these things and have just, it doesn't take very much to have a medicine bag that you 
have you have the respect for these tools that you actually keep them together. Even if you don't do this very often, you have them ready in some kind of in a place in a in a container where they're the tools of your most powerful work. You know. Let's see. One more thing about solo solo traveling is that, uh, and this could happen also in other situations, is uh, ideas of leaving your body. I had an experience at the last Salvia conference just a month ago of um, sitting with a group of people who wanted to eat the leaves late at night in a very, um, in a very respectful way. Um, they invited me to join them and chew the leaves with them, and I said, uh, no, thank you. I just, I'm, I'm hesitant about getting into leadership roles with medicine. It's a you know, big territory. But I said, I will come sit with you while you chew them and we, in the dark, in a circle, with an invocation. And when everybody's, I'm sure everybody will be just fine and cool. And when you're all into the state, I'll just slip out. It was late at night and, um, you know, it's intense being at a conference and being a presenter. And so I'll just slip out. Well, so I agreed to do that with seven people. Thirteen people showed up. And that was okay. Um, the room had was an octagon, and the entrance side of it had a little a little hallway to put your boots and things in. It was snow outside, and um, and so I sat at the open side. Everybody else could lean against something. I wasn't going to be there so long, and I thought, then I'm kind of you know the guardian just while they get going. I assured everybody they would just be um, in kind of the dream state soon, and. Um, and all of that happened, and I should tell you, uh, by the way, I experimented there with an idea that I think is very useful, which, um, you know, people, this word prayer um, is another word that um, people have either associations from childhood religions or that you have to be a different kind of person than you are to do something you call prayer. But prayer is really, as I said last night, interspecies communication. I mean, it really is just, just talking to what's there, individual or general, out loud, and um, and really putting your heart, talking from here, you know. So you have to get your head out of the way. You have to get your, your critic out of the way. The critic, I think, should go out of the way a lot of the time, as a matter of fact. I teach perception and drawing and art in nature, too, and definitely the critic is the biggest problem. It's not about dexterity or anything, you know. So uh, the same in, in prayer, but, um, but people are self-conscious in front of each other and to speak in a culture like ours where we're not used to doing this together. And so the way that we invoked that night, you know, with 13 people who didn't know each other, um, I, I really learned from the Mazatex, which is that everybody prays out loud at the same time in a soft, murmuring voice. And um, you have many words. You go on praying for, you know, a couple of minutes, or in their case, many, many minutes. But th what happens is this, this weave of voices where no, you don't have to be self-conscious because no one's listening to you. They're all praying. No one voice is louder than any other one. The words are not the same, not synchronized at all. But you get this sound, this tapestry of sound rolling, which is just wonderful and I think is a really nice kind of group invocation. So I suggest trying that. I, the Salvia ceremony was the first time that I tried that um, with people in our culture at length simultaneously. Um, and then they ate the leaves, and then one person had that occasional um, uh, experience, that, that thing that you hear of with usually the stronger um, Salvinoran kind of uh, doses of uh, suddenly wanting to bolt. He just said, you know, he was just like across the room, past me, going out the door into the snow at 10 o'clock at night, barefooted in his t-shirt, you know, and uh, everybody else was sitting in the court. We had agreed on absolute silence, and so began, this began 40 minutes of me um, trying to subdue a very strong little dude, you know, who was really intent on getting outside <laughs> and, uh, and to do it silently as much as possible. And I learned a lot, you know, I learned a lot about, um, about containing energy, about soothing, um, about uh, cajoling, whispering. Um, and at some point, and it worked, and uh, uh, you know, he was he was very sweet. He'd say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to make a problem. I'm just leaving now. And then, <laughs> you know, I'm get halfway, literally foot out in the snow. And uh, then part of him at one point said, he was like having a discussion with himself, don't you think I should have shoes on? It's cold. <laughs> like, yes, come on, let's get shoes on you. But I gradually got his, his uh, center of gravity down to the 
down low, down to the ground, because he kept, was so strong suddenly, he kept bolting up, you know, so when I got him down and I had a shawl and I had brushed him with that a lot, brushed his energy a lot, and he eventually, like, identified with my shawl, that was helpful, and he laid down on it, and, um, and, and it was neat, later he described our energy as, uh, he said he couldn't see me, but he could feel as though, you know when you put two magnets face to face, you know that, he could feel my energy not quite touching him, but I was, you know, and so these are things that you learn, techniques that you learn for dealing with those you experience with. But um, at one point, way into it, I said, what did you ask for? Because everybody was asking for something in this experience, and he said, to leave my body. <laughs> so one piece of advice is, be really careful what you ask for, and if you ask to leave your body, be sure to ask to come back to your body. And um, that made me think of this thing that the um, aboriginals do in Australia. They do a, a substance called pituri, which is a, a nicotine and, and other um, alkaloid-containing plant, and go into trances with it. I mean, many different things happen around this plant, but one piece of information I picked up there was, what, or in reading about this, I've not been there, um, was that uh, when going into a trance, chewing this substance, they the sit you know, fairly bare, you have the Australian outback image, you know, fairly bare, but they'll sit within proximity of a tree. I don't know if they use just a certain species of tree, but I would guess they probably do. And they spin from their mind in the beginning of the trance, as they're going into the sacred state, they spin from their mind to the tree a, a silk thread, like a, a spider does when they're starting to, going to another place to do a web, you know, the beginning of a web. So this silken thread to the tree and they anchor themselves to that tree in their mind and then they stay in that trance state they can travel and they can come back and they know that this solid planted being is going to be they're tethered to it you know these kind of techniques where you call on the world as multiple allies to do these things with you and you don't feel your boundary as being so separate from them as we tend to do you know are really really helpful well, I want to just uh, talk about a few things that happen in the, uh, let's see, in the form with other people. Um, I've um, had the pleasure of being in this evolving circle of, of, uh, of people. About three quarters of the time it's all women and about one quarter of the time we let in come in and, um, and and they're both great and they are different um, some of the men I know do just men's circles together but <clears throat> they do seem to like it better with women I, I, I just do think that the feminine really has a, has a, you know more natural capacity for drawing and holding this kind of energy and, and really relaxing into using it in a creative way generally speaking um and uh, the, the beginning is an example of, of this, uh, how you might do this. We really learned from the Native American church how much form they use. They are very formalized ceremony and uh, very tight rules. You know, you only walk one way around the fire all the time. You never walk um, uh, between the fire and the medicine. You have a living peyote out there as your guide. You ask that living peyote plant to be your guide in the ceremony. We don't all necessarily do peyote every time. It's hard to get, and it, you know, sometimes that has been it. But, but peyote's the guide because the peyote loves this form. That's the sense of it. Yeah. They say that um, you're actually in ceremony for four days, like from, from the time you walk into the teepee to, you know, four Dave, days after that. Well, you integrate it, yes. And that's the time in which there are certain rules that you, you abide by during those four days, huh? I asked before who had done Native American church ceremonies, but you have, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know that, that Bill knows a lot about peyote. So, um, thank you. I, maybe you'd like to... I just to add that. Yeah, well, you might like to add other things, because I, I have thought of you, and I know that you have a lot of experience. Um, so, we follow that in terms of... Uh, but with variations, because that's what we are. We're, you know, adapting ritual to the present, and we make these teas then... Uh, LSD tea um, or a mescaline tea um, something that we ask to follow in the path in the footsteps of the peyote as the guide but it is not it may be a contemporary uh, medicine um, 
And, uh, and as I said, we dress beautifully for each other because beauty is medicine. We hang beautiful cloths on the walls of the teepee. The fire is beautiful. We bring lots of really good wood um, to be right there at the door. There is one person who is fire person. These follow some of the rules of the, of the native um, ceremony. There's a fire person, there's a water person, there's a medicine woman. She's measured it out. She decides when a new pitcher should go around. She decides when the, you know, the, uh, oh, there's a tradition of midnight water which is offered and you don't drink anything other than the tea until, until the midnight water. And yet we offer these things in, you know, beautiful English teapots and tiny teacups. I mean, we've just made it our own, you know. And, uh, and then after midnight, when you're going into the, the dark part of the journey, I mean, it's hard to stay awake. Sitting up, this is everybody sitting up, singing, passing the, the, passing the rattle, passing the staff all night long, um, singing songs that come to us, uh, medicine songs. And you do this until dawn. And so the hard hours in there, two, three, four, um, are very tricky. We... Um, pass a pipe at a certain point, a cannabis pipe. Um, and the intention is, in these group circles, is to share what we learn, what we have learned, in our, you know, by our singing and by our energy, share what we've learned since the last time we did this, and to send out healing energy to the world, to recognize what's out there, to, to be, to some degree, um, you know, to emulate the sorrowing goddesses. Um, I went a few months ago uh, to Ecuador and, you know, saw it's, it's something that I have talked a lot about recently but I'm not going to now, but I saw you know, a picture of the end of the world the end of the world for many people, the end of the world for nature it was, the destruction was the most shocking that I, I've ever witnessed and I've been there before and I, I saw the changes and, um, and I just came back weeping daily multiple times daily uh, for six weeks or so and um, you know, I've come out of it some, which is good because I couldn't figure out how I was going to do this conference in the state of mind I was in. But um, I just had to get into the idea that there are, th- that, you know, many of the, the deities that the icons are made of uh, um, in the world, especially the feminine ones, are weeping. And, and it's a kind of a beautiful sorrowing. It's just a sorrowing for the constant loss. You know, I, I thought, gee, I got so into it I could write, you know, one of those by the cash register bestsellers called Living with Entropy. <laughs> I'm really trying to find out what's great about entropy. You know? um, <laughs> but, uh, but that's part of what comes up is sorrowing and celebrating. And I have learned from Native people and uh, from Native women particularly to honor each other. And so part of what comes up is honoring, is singing about the beautiful... Um, People, the beautiful qualities in people that we see, um, the unseen strengths in the world. Um, you know, I, it's a very personal thing, but but maybe it's a good illustration. In one of these um, events uh, last summer, I um, sang about a, a spirit I had really gotten in touch with in the past year, and that was. Um, you know, Terence was my husband once upon a time, and we had a, a very troubled relationship for the last decade. But um, in the time that he was dying, I was really aware of his mother, who died before I ever met her, died 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I was really aware of the spirit of Terence's mother visiting her dying child, and how mothers tend their children no matter what and spirit mothers tend their spirit children and I just there were were a few weeks in there where I just woke up every morning feeling her hovering around her taking care of things her holding his hand and crossing over and so you know I sang a song about um, Terrence's mother and and about that that quality of motherhood and it touches everybody you know everybody has some relationship to these kind of archetypal presences. So it's the kind of thing that can come up in, in a very intricate, um, heartfelt, courageous, psychedelic ceremony. Um, and, uh, and another possibility I'd like to mention is 
is that of distance viewing, as we've heard about here, you know, taking something and looking far away, and I'm getting cut off, okay, and distant, and distant healing, and I just want to say that that's possible too, that going to people who you know are in trouble far away in these states of mind, and, and sending them healing energy, going into the Ill, illness, and um, visualizing it, and bringing golden, I, I find golden pink light to be very useful in, in, in that kind of thing, it's possible. So set up these, this vessel around you, go into the vessel, and then, and then and have a list of possibilities of things you might do in there, and then allow them to happen. And that's really you know, what you have to get back to, is just allow these things to well up. And uh, I would love to hear, and now I've talked the entire time and have no chance to ask questions, but um, I would love to hear techniques or forms that people have discovered um, that really work for you in psychedelic ceremony, solo or in groups. And um, if you'd like to talk with me, uh, you know, in another context, I'd, I'd appreciate it. But thank you very much. You're listening to the Psychedelic Salon, where people are changing their lives one thought at a time. To tell the truth, Although I have a very clear memory of Kat giving this talk, I really didn't remember her comments near the end about Terence's mother. In fact, I hadn't even planned on mentioning Terence at all in this podcast because the work that Kat has done and is doing is uh, vast and extremely important, and in many ways her work has actually overshadowed what Terence did. But I have to admit that tears came to my eyes when she told the story of her vision of Terence's mother coming to him as he was dying. Now, I'm not planning on dying anytime soon myself, but I do have to admit that if I knew that my mother would return for that event, that I'd really be looking forward to it. An interesting little synchronicity that occurred just as I was in the middle of previewing this talk was when the phone rang, and it was Bruce Damer telling me about the webinar that Dennis McKenna is currently giving over at Evolver.com. And the first thing he told me about it, without having any idea of what I was just doing, is that Dennis had just been singing Cat's praises for having been able to live with Terrence for 17 years, uh, which was no small feat. So I guess that fact should be mentioned, although it is the content of what Cat had to say just now that I hope is uh, the thing that stays with you. After returning uh, from that Palenque conference where Cat gave the talk that we just heard, one of the first things I did was to put together a little medicine kit for myself. And since then, I have actually created a couple of rituals that I now use on my solo flights. And I highly recommend that you do the same if you are really serious about this great work. Like every other kind of work, you need both a tool kit and an outline of what's to be done. You know, with good tools and good plans, there's really no limit to what you can do. Also, I hope that you caught the part when Kat was talking about singing during a psychedelic experience, and she mentioned the fact that you don't have to be a shaman and know the old Icaros or other songs, but that even singing a favorite childhood lullaby is also good practice. And while I'm sure that many of our female slawners have done that, I also recommend it to you men. And the more macho you are, the more important it may be to sing yourself a lullaby once in a while during your journeys. I know that I've done so on a few occasions, and I was amazed at all the things that I dredged up by doing it. All in all, the times that I've done that turned into quite fantastic experiences. So uh, give it a try sometime and see what you think. Now before I go, there is one more thing that I'd like to cover. And that is to mention the fact that at long last, the Timothy Leary Archive has found a permanent home. And where might that be, you ask? Well, it is now safely ensconced in a place where scholars will easily be able to find it. The New York City Public Library. I've posted an article about this on my personal blog, and already there are news stories about it all over the place. But here's the gist of what they say, and, and I'm quoting here. There are 335 boxes of papers, videotapes, photographs, and more that the New York Public Library is planning to announce that it has purchased from the Leary Estate. The material documents the evolution of the tweedy middle-aged academic into a drug guru, international outlaw, gubernatorial candidate, computer software designer, and progenitor of the me-decades self-absorbed interest in self-help. 
The archive will not be available to the public or scholars for 18 to 24 months as the library organizes the papers. It is a unique first-hand archive of the 1960s. Leary was at the epicenter of what was going on back then, and some of the stuff in there is extraordinary. And that, too, is quite an understatement. As uh, I've mentioned in previous podcasts, the task of keeping this valuable collection together fell to Dennis Berry, and she went way above and beyond the call of duty to keep it safe all these years. And that was no small task, because when Bruce Damer took me to see it, at the time it filled, and I mean filled to the top, two self-storage units. So I can see why it'll take the library so long to organize these papers. You see, uh, Tim Leary was, among other things, a major pack rat. And uh, during my time poking through the boxes in the archive, I came across things like his mother's notation about the time and day that baby Timothy made his first splash in the bathtub. The first of many splashes, I should add. He even kept his laundry receipts from when he was in prison. It's a, <laughs> it's a truly amazing archive, and I hope that one day you get a chance to prowl through it yourself. And uh, I'll have more to say about the Leary Archive in future podcasts with Bruce Damer, but uh, that's going to have to wait for a while. There is one more thing on my mind, however, and I guess it was uh, thinking about Leary in the 60s and then just now hearing Kat talk about her experiences during that era that took me back in time for a bit and has caused me to compare then and now. First of all, I definitely think that now is better, so let's get that out of the way. However, that by no means implies that those chaotic days back then weren't good in many ways. Every once in a while, you know, I I hear people from my generation put down on themselves because, well, in many ways, we've become the people who are causing the problems rather than solving them. In effect, uh, we have become the generation who is now propping up a dying empire and an unsustainable civilization. But that we is meant collectively and generally because the people who say this are often still quite engaged in various forms of social change movements, uh, some like the currently booming home gardening movement. What doesn't seem very much changed is the world of commerce and politics. But let me take you back for just a moment and point out a few things that the 60s generation did accomplish. For one thing, the legal structure of apartheid in the southern states has been abolished. Do we still have a long way to go in the realm of race relations? Of course. But I have some pictures that I took in New Orleans during the early 60s where there are signs all over the place pointing out that most facilities were for whites only. Then there was this little thing called the American War in Vietnam. And that was a human travesty of the first order, a a crime against humanity in my book. And I know that firsthand because I was there. But back then there was a military draft, and that more than anything else, I think, was the rallying point for the high school and college students to focus on. And their disruptive and ongoing protest eventually had a major impact on ending that insane war. Now, bringing about the beginning of the end of apartheid in this country, and ending what was at the time the nation's longest war, And eventually ending the military draft seems like a a few accomplishments that the 60s generation can point to with pride. But what happened next? Well, we had children and responsibilities, and we were getting older and had less energy to go out and man the barricades. So we redirected our energy and built something to leave behind. It's called the Internet. And yes, having myself worked deep in the bowels of the net for many years, I realized that a significant amount of the actual code running the world's largest machine was cut by kids much younger than us. But it was the women and men from the 60s generation who by then had moved into middle and upper management and were the ones who recklessly approved huge budgets to develop technology that at the time showed no promise of bringing the corporate behemoths we were working for the profits that they were lusting after. In fact, there were countless managers who lost their jobs for approving some of those projects. And guess what else? Who did we hire to do this groundbreaking work? Acid heads for the most part. In case you didn't already know this, the internet was designed, built, and is currently being operated largely by women and men who think of themselves as members of the tribe. So I for one am proud to be a member of that generation. Even though I didn't do drugs until many years later, and even though the first anti-war demonstration that I attended 
was one where uh, hundreds of us Vietnam vets threw our military medals on the steps of the Federal Building in Houston, Texas, just a uh, year or so before the Paris Peace Accords were signed. So I wasn't at the leading edge of the 60s consciousness back then, but it's never too late, I decided, and so today I like to think of myself as a flower child who slept through the 60s, but now that I'm awake, I'm going to do whatever I can to wake up the rest of the sleepers from back then, along with their children and grandchildren. And now we've got this great big stick called the Internet with which to keep the screwheads on the run. I guess that the only thing that seems missing to me right now, and it's most likely here, but I'm just not aware of it, is the kind of protest music that so inspired us back then. I can still remember songs like The Eve of Destruction, which was one of the ultimate protest songs from back then. It had lines like, You don't believe in war, but what's that gun you're toting? And words like that had a profound effect on us back then, particularly those of us who had been forced into the military by the draft. But today's corporate rock seems to keep songs like that out of their catalogs. Heck, uh, even Springsteen and U2 seem to me to have sold out and are making a lot of those sappy, lovesick songs that fill the airwaves these days. But now that I'm thinking about it, uh, why don't I just play the Turtles version of the Eve of Destruction right now, just to uh, give you a little better idea of what I'm trying to say. So, if you'll please indulge me, here it is. The Eastern world, it is exploding, violence flaring. Bullets loading, you're old enough to kill, but not for voting. You don't believe in war, but what's that gun you're toting? And even the Jordan River has bodies floating. But you tell me over and over and over again, my friend, how you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. Understand what I'm trying to say And can't you feel the fears that I'm feeling today If the button is pushed, there's no running away There'll be no one to save with the world in a grave Take a look around you, boy It's bound to scare you, boy And you tell me over and over and over again My friend, I you don't There is in red China Then take a look around To Selma, Alabama You may leave here For four days in space But when you return It's the same old place The pounding of the drums The pride and disgrace You can bury your dead But don't leave a trace Hate your next door neighbor But don't forget to say grace and tell me over and over and over and over again, my friend You don't believe we're on the eve of destruction Oh, no, no, you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction And for what it's worth, my friend, I also don't believe that we are on the eve of destruction. It may look like that from time to time, but the way I see it is that the chaos that is all around us today is just what comes from any construction project when at the very beginning the ground must first be cleared and the trash hauled away before something new can be built. It's that way with buildings, and it's that way with new societies that will one day lead us to a new civilization. Uh, a peaceful, cooperative, sustainable, truly human civilization. So why not take a little time today and create a ritual for yourself and your family that will help you to remain focused on building a world to which you would like to return one day. 
And for now, this is Lorenzo signing off from Cyberdelic Space. Be well, my friends. <laughs>